Hey, for those of you who haven't met me, my name is Gabrielle Sokolsky. I'm an entomologist and I'm the superintendent here at Cape Cod Mosquito Control Project. Um, just to give you an idea of how the Mosquito Project is organized, we're a um, quasi-state agency. We are paid for by the 15 member towns that make up Barnstable County. Um, it's one of those strange, I'm sure you all are familiar with government, strange relationships, how things work. The money goes from our towns back into the Department of Agricultural Resources and then comes back to us. So I say we work for our towns. We were the first organized mosquito control project in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We were established in 1930 through legislation. It was actually um, the businesses that got together that wanted mosquito control on the Cape. They wanted people to stay. They wanted the tourists to say the mosquitoes were a problem that were keeping people away. So they decided to get together and create this legislation that created mosquito control. I'm an entomologist, so I'm going to start with uh, pictures of bugs because I just love pictures of bugs, <laughs> but I hope all of you do too. Uh, so we use integrated pest management here on the Cape and so do all the other mosquito control projects um, in Massachusetts to control mosquitoes. So the first step of any good integrated pest management plan is being able to identify your pest and know your pest's life cycle and know when in your their life cycle you wanna target them with an action to prevent their populations from growing to beyond a threshold where it's acceptable to you, the public, where they're creating a problem in some way. Um, mosquitoes go through complete metamorphosis. I'm sure you all know this. They start out in the egg stage. Mosquito eggs are laid on or around standing water, either in, you can see that one mosquito in this picture is laying a raft of eggs. Those are a lot of times the species of mosquitoes you see in artificial containers and man-made containers that lay those rafts. You can see those rafts. They have about two, 300 eggs in each raft. They look like, oh my gosh, I feel like the tick people and the mosquito people are always using food examples, but they kind of look like rye seeds except for they don't sink because they have to float on the surface because they need the oxygen in the air. They, they're, this type of egg is not meant to be submerged. There are other mosquito um, species that lay their eggs like around the corner of the edge of the water so they can go through being submerged and then drying out and then being submerged again. Um, and they can stay in the egg stage for a long time. Most of them overwinter in the egg stage <clears throat> the sawmarsh species can be in the egg stage for up to 10 years. So if you had a big storm and it pushed those, the water way up so the edge of the water was much further um, upland than you'd expect, they may lay their eggs at the upper edges of that marsh. And then maybe you don't get a storm that floods that again for 10 years. They're there, they're waiting, they'll hatch when the water hits them. We get a lot of people who call our office um, with the mosquito issue making a request. And one of the first things we tell people is to go around their yard and look for any standing water in their yard. I think there's a disconnect with some people in the public between what's moving around in the water and what's flying around biting them. I hate it when people call and tell me they have baby flies. They'll call, they'll be like, the greenhead flies are out. We put out those boxes as well. They'll be like, the baby flies are here. Small flies are obviously not <laughs> baby flies. Science education for the public, thanks for all you do because yeah, they need it. <laughs> um, so the eggs hatch into the larval stage. The mosquito larvae depend on standing water. They can live in standing water, not mud. Um, it has to be some standing water. They breathe air. So this is the mosquito larva sort of hanging. This is the surface of the water at the top. And this is the siphon they use to breathe through. It's kind of like a snorkel. They have to surface to breathe every so often. They're filter feeders. So these hairs at the front of their head are being used to grab up anything in the water. They're feeding on anything organic, algae, bacteria, whatever's in the water, that's what they're picking up and feeding on. So for most species, the more organic the water, the more food they have. Um, larval stage, feed and grow, get to the pupal stage. Mosquito pupa are, I think a lot of people think about pupal insects as like a butterfly in a cocoon. So similar to that, this is where they develop those adult characteristics like wings that they need or um, different adult characteristics. 
but they're in water. So there are a lot of predators there. They move around. They're actually a lot quicker than the mosquito larva. And they also have to surface to breathe the air. Unfortunately, this is the part of the life cycle that most people see when they think about mosquitoes. They're just general insects. I use this picture it's more for education. Um, the males and females both feed on nectar for sugar. They need the sugar for energy to fly around. That's all male mosquitoes feed on is nectar. Um, I know a lot of times I get questions from people about whether they can act as pollinators. They are not hairy at all. They do not carry pollen from plant to plant, unfortunately. Then they'd have at least that little bit of something you could say they do, were doing that was good, but no. So anyway, this is all the males feed on. The females have specialized mouth parts for taking a blood meal. The female mosquitoes bite because they need the protein in your blood to develop their eggs. So in that larval stage, they're feeding on things like algae, bacteria, not enough protein to develop her eggs. So she's evolved to find that protein elsewhere. There are one or two species of mosquitoes, not that I've ever seen on the Cape, that are actually predatory in their larval stage where they'll feed on other mosquitoes, which would be fabulous if we had more of those. Um, I haven't seen those species on the Cape, but those species don't necessarily need to take a blood meal. They're getting protein in the larval stage. Um, anyway, I always love to show this picture. I think people look at a mosquito, well, if, if they looked at a mosquito <laughs> closely before they slapped it, they look at a mosquito and they know that they have that long proboscis for feeding. Um, I think they look at that and think of that as like a straw, but actually it's a lot of different mouth parts. What you're looking at when you're looking at the proboscis um, is actually the labium. It's a sheath that's covering a lot of different mouth parts. So as she bites, that sheath pushes back. She has below there things that act like swords that pierce the skin. And then she has actually two tubes that they form. One tube is for spinning her saliva into you. As you know, when you get cut or have an injury, your blood starts to clot right away. She's adding an anticoagulant to keep your blood from clotting so she could keep it a liquid and she could keep feeding on it. Um, that's when disease transmission occurs. A mosquito will bite something else that is infected with say dog heartworm or Eastern cephalitis, depending on the disease. She picks up that disease from the infected host and then that disease has evolved a way to find its way out of her gut and back into her salivary glands so that when she spits her saliva into you with that anticoagulant, that disease goes with it. So whether, again, whether it's the worms from dog heartworm or whether it's the virus for Eastern encephalitis or West Nile virus, that's when that transmission occurs. Um, and the other tube is what she's using to suck up your blood. We have about 25 species that I commonly find on Cape Cod of different mosquitoes. Of those species, most species are found in freshwater habitats. Mosquito species are very specific Ooh, that's a little redundant, about the type of habitat, where they lay their eggs and where they develop. So the type of mosquito, the species of mosquito that lays her eggs in an abandoned cranberry bog, where it tends to be very acidic water, will not be the same species of mosquito that lays her eggs in a bucket full of rainwater with leaves in it. They're very specific about the types of habitat. Um, and so that helps us with our job. We're controlling mosquitoes here in Cape Cod when they're in their developmental stages. Um, we're not doing any of the truck spraying that they're doing off Cape. So I'm sure you've maybe seen the news when Tripoli was a big thing um, and risk of transmission got to be high. You would see on the nightly news that other mosquito districts were driving trucks around at night spraying an adult side. We don't do that on the Cape. We're lucky, um, lucky, I guess lucky. Our habitat allows us to be able to control mosquitoes when they're in that developmental stage. You want to get them before they're by, flying around biting people. We have um, a couple of species of mosquitoes that are salt marsh mosquitoes, and we have one species of mosquito, two that you find in brackish water. These mosquitoes are less likely the saltwater mosquitoes. The brackish ones may be um, capable of transmitting disease, they are. Uh, but the saltwater mosquitoes are not necessarily good vectors of disease. They tend to bite mammals. 
So with the diseases, and I'll mention it later here, most of the ones that were, the two diseases that we're really concerned with here on Cape Cod are West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis. Um, salt marsh mosquitoes rarely bite birds and those are a bird mosquito cycle. So it's very, it's less extremely unlikely that those species will be carrying those diseases. Um, the unfortunate side of those species are they fly for miles to find a blood meal. So a mosquito that hatches in the salt marsh will easily fly up to 10 miles to find a blood meal. Um, and in a little tiny section of the marsh, you could get hundreds of mosquitoes hatching and then flying into town to bite all those people who have gathered in town. Salt marsh mosquitoes bite during the day. So they're different from those freshwater species. And it's easy again to tell for targeting, for control. If people are calling, one of the first questions we ask are whether you're getting bitten by mosquitoes in the daytime or in the evening. Um, some species of mosquitoes will only bite when it's dark out. Other species will bite, other species will bite in the day if you're in the shade and you bother their resting spot, for instance. So you might get bitten there. But for the most part, it's saltwater mosquitoes that are biting during the day. And again, they're flying far. So we had um, we had one instance in Barnesville. Every year we have at least one situation where we get salt marsh mosquitoes that fly, where we didn't know changes in the, everybody, all of you know this, changes in the coast happen and something closes off and there's standing water that we are, it is unex, unexpected to our crews. And so for, we may get an instance where those mosquitoes hatch and you've got a lot of saltwater mosquitoes flying. And we've had a couple of those happen in Barnesville and it's just, it's just so much. We had one case a number of years ago where there was a section on Sandy Neck where a lot of mosquitoes hatched from and you could follow them across the Cape. We started getting calls from 6A from all the people there. And then, oh my goodness, the potato chip factory, they have those big bays where the doors are open. They are getting killed at the potato chip factory. And you can just follow it all the way across Cape Cod, that horde of mosquitoes. It was so bad. And, and we can tell you don't get just one or two calls from residents. You get like 50 calls from residents. It's okay. We, we can go, we'll track down where they came from. We'll take care of that. People People don't necessarily like to hear it if it's their two weeks of vacation, but we don't, again, have any way of spraying for adult mosquitoes. So you're gonna have to wait for that horde to die off in the week or two that they spend as adults. And then you won't have them again because we'll find the source, we'll take care of them at the source and then you shouldn't have them again. Um, so IPM is about identifying your pest and then going out and monitoring for your pest. So this is kind of a map of the, uh, this is a map of Cape Cod that's divided up into 143 quadrants. Back in the 1920s, before Cape Cod mosquito control was established, they hired an entomologist who like had the best job ever just to walk around the Cape and identify habitats where mosquitoes might be developing. They put those all on maps, um, whoops. So the, we have those old maps that were done in the 20s. So they're actually USGS topo maps where they put the wetlands on there and they actually color coded some of them. This is Scorton Creek. So you can imagine red was salt marsh habitat. Um, all of those sites, you can see there are numbers on here. All of those sites were given unique identifying numbers. We use those numbers today. So from the 20s to, oh, from the 20s to the 20s. Wow, <laughs> I just yeah, hundred that. years, right? Mm -hmm. From the twenties to the twenties, we're still using these site IDs, and we still follow the work that we're that we do in these sites. Um, we follow changes in these sites. Yeah, wow, I didn't think of that until I just said that. Now, um, anyway, we've updated in the nineties. Um, we went to using um, digitized maps. The, where we have these sites on them. Today we use ArcGIS online. All of our trucks have iPads, mini iPads in them with the maps, with the sites. So they can give us real time information on what they're doing at those sites. They just click on it and enter the data for whatever they did there that day, whether it was checking for mosquito larva, and then if they found enough treating for them or whether it was brushing or cleaning a ditch, all of that stuff. So we have that right now we have it. I think, and I sent Julie information 
it, we have it kind of in two databases because we switched up to the ArcGIS online in 2014. So everything else is in an access database, but we have that information so that if it's easy for us to go back to 2014 quickly, the rest of it just takes us, you know, searching the other database for it, but not much longer. So if anybody has any questions about any sites, happy to assist. So identifying your pest and knowing where the habitat is, going out and monitoring. This is what our crews are doing in the summertime. They actually go to all of these sites. We have about 4,000 potential sites on Cape Cod. I've got 10 crews that work in different sections of Cape Cod where they're going out. Um, crews of two people, although I haven't backfilled through COVID, so some of them are crews of one people right now. Um, checking for mosquito larvae, they take samples and they look to see whether they've met a threshold where you need to do some control action. So they have a standard dipper. This is what it would look like full of mosquito larvae. That is definitely meeting the threshold where we're gonna to need to take some action. You usually see a grouping of mosquito larvae like this, like a lot of them in salt marshes because you'll have the moon tides, oh, like right now. I think through Saturday, we've got over 12 foot tides going on. So by next week, they'll have hatched. And as the water dries pretty quickly, you'll see them starting to get into small areas where you get a lot of mosquitoes in one scoop. So obviously we've reached our threshold. So we're gonna take some action. This is an overhead view of the Great Marsh in West Barnstable. So a lot of what we do is water management. Half of our year is water management. Um, you can see on here the ditches. These were actually put in by work progress people and different groups before mosquito control was around in Mass in on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, since we're the first. Um, so more than 100 years ago, human beings finally had germ theory and technology to know that mosquitoes were actually transmitting diseases. So before that, malaria, for instance, actually literally means bad air. They thought that you got malaria by opening up your window and smelling all that stinky swamp air, and then you'd get sick. That was where you got malaria. So a little more than 100 years ago now that we had that technology and human beings realized that malaria was actually being transmitted by mosquitoes. Malaria is a hard one because it looks so different in its different stages. You don't look at malaria in a person and malaria in a mosquito and see the same thing, like literally see the same thing. The parasite goes through a lot of changes. So it was, I get it. It was hard to figure that out. So anyway, they figured that out. And then globally, there were all these different um, actions that took place to reduce mosquito populations. And one of them here was opening up ditches on the marshes. The ditches serve two purposes. They help move water off the marsh more quickly after a rain event or after moon tides. They also, you can sort of see with this one, you can see my cursor. Okay, so you can see with this one, it's kind of a shallow ditch that goes up to this standing water. The idea isn't to drain the water out of these pools. The idea is to have a shallow ditch that allows the fish to get into the pools. If the fish have access to the standing water, we don't have to do anything else. The mosquitoes are taken care of by the natural predators that are already in that area. So that's why the, we do selective ditch maintenance now. When those ditches were put in, I don't think, um, well, obviously we have probably learned something over the past more than hundred years about how salt marshes work and how different systems work. So we definitely do not clean all those ditches. We maintain, ditches that serve a purpose for mosquito control. So again, like, especially like these shallow ditches to let the fish up in them, it's not really about draining anything. Whoops, it's not really about draining anything. It's more about letting predators have access to those areas. Um, so we do brushing so that we can have access to these places to get in to do surveillance. So this is, I think, typically what people think of as the type of work we do. If you go out on a salt marsh to look at ditches, you're not gonna be able to go out and see these ditches unless you first mow down those Phragmites so that you can get through them to actually do maintenance on them. We do a lot of work on access paths. We also have to be able to get into the swamps to be able to take those samples because again, we're not, um, we're not applying the larvicides by helicopter. Some of the other projects do that as well. 
We have people who are walking around and they're doing um, targeted treatments to areas just where they find larva. So they've got to get through to be able to take those samples to look to see whether we're at a place where we need to take an action. There are also freshwater ditches as well as salt marsh ditches. This is Brewster. This is going right through the center of town parallel to Route 6A. You got the Constine ditch. It's beautiful. Um, a lot of the freshwater ditches were put in though, or and we maintain them because of development. There used to be ways that the water used to naturally run through Cape Cod. It's a very wet place and roads were built and people built houses. I always think of the one house in Dennis that has a giant pipe under the house because apparently they had to build that house at the end of a drainage system that was a naturally flowing creek. And so with that house sitting there, the water can't run anymore. The water's got to go somewhere. There's a giant pipe under the house. Um, so we work on those ditches. Right now, all of our work is done by hand, like the picture, like burn, raking out things that are obstructions in the water, things like that. Keep the water moving and allow, again, predators access to areas where mosquitoes might be developing. We do have low ground pressure um, equipment that we can use for ditch maintenance. I have to say that we've had some technical problems with that low ground pressure equipment. So usually with this slide, I'd be like, this is how many feet of ditch we did using this equipment, but um, we didn't do any work with the equipment last year. So this is kind of what it looks like after it's gone through somewhere. I, it's really useful to be able to use this in some place like a salt marsh. That equipment, that machine right there is um, the type of machine that they use on the ski slopes to groom the slopes. It weighs less than two pounds per square inch. It's very low ground pressure. Um, and what it does is as it goes through and pulls the spoil out of the ditch, it's laying a very thin layer across the marsh so you don't get a pile of spoil. It makes it nice and I know it doesn't look like it in this picture, but after a day or two, the grass pops right back up. Could be rain, could be whatever. It's very neat. I know it doesn't look neat because it's shooting mud out of it in this picture, but it's very neat. Army Corps um, considers this work to be no impact. So when I fill out the forms for Army Corps, nice. It falls under our general permit for maintenance of ditches as well. So we've got a new machine now um, that actually has the rotary ditcher on the arm so that we don't have to straddle the ditches. So can't wait to take that out into the marsh, see what's going on there. Um, we also, again, it's about keeping the water moving. This is the back road on Sandy Neck, but we do a lot of work keeping pipes open, culverts open. We work with towns on issues like this because it's as important to us as it is to the whole system that the water, the way the water used to naturally run, not be impeded by a road, for instance. So this is the back of Barnstable. Again, this is the road that you take out to the cottages on the other side of Sandy Neck. And you can see, this is, this is a lot of times what you see. There's this natural creek that's coming along and then there's a road in the way. It used to be this little tiny plastic pipe that would get crushed every time some big truck would drive over it. And then we'd have water building up over on this side that couldn't get back out after the tides have come through. And so that was creating mosquito habitat. It was also flooding the road for the town. And it was also impeding the natural way that the water was supposed to be running. So we work with the towns on issues like that. A lot of times there are overlaps between restoration projects and mosquito control. I want the water to keep moving in and out the way it naturally used to. And so do the restoration folks. So we work a lot with those people as well. Um, and herring runs as well. So there are gonna be places where about half of our year from September through April, March, we're doing water management and opening up paths for ditch maintenance. This time of year, our crews all switch over in April to checking for mosquitoes and treating for mosquitoes. Most of what we use is a bacterial product, BTI, either in a granular form, it, they, um, they impregnate it on corn cob. So it's 
broken up corn cob and you put it in the water and it dissolves and the bacteria is there. The mosquito larvae are filter feeders. So they feed on that BTI, it gets into their gut and in their gut, it creates a toxin. It actually works in a couple of different ways in the mosquito. So you don't see resistance building up to it and the mosquito larvae die. It's very targeted. I know um, maybe some of you know of other BT products that can be used against things like Lepidoptera, like moths, um, or against, there are some for beetles. This is not the same, um, uh-oh, like bacteria variant as the other bacteria that's being used for, you know what I mean though, moths and other things. BTI is specifically for flies, diptera, and mosquitoes are in that category. The only other um, insects that it can affect are other flies and not at the level that we apply it. They use BTI, for instance, to control black flies in rivers in some places. They apply it at a much, much, much higher rate, maybe 10 times, because uh, it's flowing water. So you've also got it flowing by. It's, it's insects, um, flies that feed in that same filter feeding way. So for midges, for instance, there are some midges that feed in that same way. Um, it's also at a higher rate than we're applying it for mosquitoes. So for midge control, some people do midge con control. I don't know, they, they're not biting, they're just flying around, I don't get it. But there are places where they do midge control. They use BTI, I think it's at three or four times the rate that we use it. Again, it's, it's very specific at the rate we're using it for mosquito larvae. So it's a nice targeted approach. Um, we also do education. So we do, once we have, so as part of our integrated pest management plan, we use water management, larva siding, and education. We get about maybe 300 calls in the summertime for people who are having a mosquito um, problem. We'll go out to their house. For each one of those calls, we actually go out to their house. The crew will do a survey of their property to see where the mosquitoes might be coming from. Because even though it's Katie's first question, do you have any standing water on your property? Usually the answer is no. And then our crew ends up going out there. It could be anything, a tire, a bucket. In the middle of summer when it's warm, water, as long as water sits for seven days, you can have mosquitoes lay eggs, go through larva, go through pupa, flying adults. So people hate that when you get to their house and tell them it's just dump out the water and you won't have mosquitoes or clean your gutters. That's sometimes me, I admit it. <laughs> I don't see the water sit in my gutters. Um, the last part of any integrated pest management plan after you've done your control is to go back out and monitor to see if you were successful with the type of control methods you were using. To do that, we use light traps. Um, there are a few different types of light traps that we use, but they're all generally the same way. These light traps are being used to monitor for mammal biting mosquitoes, what's biting people, so we can see what species are out there and we can compare numbers because we've been using the same trap sites for, well, for many years now. I'm getting older by the minute. Um, so these traps work the same way. The bucket at the top has carbon dioxide, has dry ice in it. The dry ice is frozen carbon dioxide. As the dry ice turns from solid to gas, it falls down over that trap. The mosquitoes think something's standing there breathing. They come in towards that trap. Whoops, it's very sensitive. Um, and there's a little light in these traps. So they, further away, they smell the carbon dioxide. They come in towards that to find what's breathing there. And then they see that light. So they go to the light and there's a fan right below the light. So they get sucked into the net. <laughs> We put these out, you can see these are our trap locations from 2020. We've got 18 trap sites around Cape Cod. You know, weather patterns are different all over Cape Cod. I could be leaving our lab in Harwich and it's sunny and then you get to Provincetown, it's fogged in, you get down to Bourne, it's actually raining. You get to Woods Hole, now it's foggy again. So we have the traps spread out both to give you a variety of habitats so we can look at different species, but also weather conditions across Cape Cod. So we're collecting those. We start setting those the first week of June and we collect them on a weekly basis through the summer. So that's looking for efficacy. We also have traps that we put out looking for virus. So we are the only people on Cape Cod who are doing collections for surveillance for arbovirus. So 
on a weekly basis, starting in the middle of June, those mosquitoes then that we're collecting will be going through those species, looking for species that might be carrying disease because there are only a few species that have evolved to be able to transmit diseases. Most species end up, they take a blood meal, the virus or whatever it is, dog heartworm, whatever, has not evolved to find a way back out of their gut. So it just gets digested with everything else. But there are some species that are capable of carrying diseases. And again, here on Cape Cod, we're looking at the diseases, West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis. Both of those diseases have a bird mosquito cycle. So the birds, the birds come into the area carrying these diseases, whether it's West Nile virus or Eastern equine encephalitis. A mosquito picks up that virus and carries it to another bird. That's the natural cycle of these diseases. If viruses could think, and I don't even know if I accept the fact that viruses are alive, but if they could, they, they would choose to always go to birds. Mosquito bird, mosquito bird, mosquito bird. Every so often, a species of mosquito that bites both birds and people will carry that disease into the human population. We're a dead end host for those diseases. So a person with West Nile virus cannot, a mosquito can't bite it and transmit it to another person. That, that was the issue with different diseases like Zika or yellow fever. Those are diseases where a mosquito could bite a person, pick it up and carry it to another person. The diseases in our area are not like that. They're all being carried in by birds. Gabby, quick question. Does arbovirus mean virus that arbovirus to a bird or what is the it, Arbovirus means a virus that's being carried by a mosquito or arthropod. Oh, yeah. okay. Arbovirus. Thanks for asking. Okay, so people are listening. I'm I'm watching you. It looks like but I know it's it's so hard presenting and not knowing if everyone's listening, but we are. It is. Okay, thank you. We're just it's, muted, but we're we're all listening. <laughs> it's funny with Zoom, you feel like you're in a room talking to yourself sometimes. You After do, a yeah. while, you're like, am I talking to people or anyway? I, know. I, know. I try to remember not to like scratch my nose or something. Um <laughs> So anyway, Eastern equine encephalitis is a much more serious disease than West Nile virus. I'll start with Eastern equine encephalitis. Um, for the people who get it and show symptoms, you get about a 50% mortality rate. So it's a very serious disease. People who survive Eastern equine encephalitis tend to have long-term um, effects going on. I met a person, I gave a talk at the Museum of Natural History in Brewster a number of years ago, and I met a lady who had had Eastern equine encephalitis. She's the only person I've met who had it. And she had contracted it, not on Cape Cod. Nobody on Cape Cod has ever contracted Eastern equine encephalitis in the history of testing. But she had contracted it on a camping trip in New York State. She was in a coma for two weeks. She woke up. It took her a year to learn how to walk and talk again. And 20 years later, when I met her, she was still having effects. And she was actually one of the lucky people because again, about half the people who get that virus die from that virus. This is the mosquito. Oh, and encephalitis, just to say, is actually a symptom of a disease. That's not a disease. We get a lot of calls in the summer somebody has encephalitis, they're sure it came from mosquitoes. Encephalitis means swelling of the brain. It, it's not necessarily caused by mosquito-borne disease. Um, that takes a little more testing. So this mosquito here is the mosquito species where this disease is amplified. So this is Culicida melanora. Literally, if you look at that picture, the most boring mosquito ever, right? There's not even any pretty marks on her or anything. Um, she's a bird biting mosquito. She's the one that's amplifying the disease. That's why she's the enzootic vector. She's taking that disease from bird to bird and causing that disease to increase in the bird population to a point where it might transmit then from a mosquito into the human population. I always talk to people about this. She lays her eggs and she develops in red maple swamps and Atlantic white cedar swamps. She likes that acidic habitat where there are crypts under the trees. That mosquito loves to lay her eggs in those crypts under the trees where the water's sitting. And um, yeah, she's very hard to control. She overwinters in the larval stage. So even in the middle of winter, if there's ice over the swamp, you can find these mosquitoes. They can survive being in the ice. They've got a um, Interfreeze in their cells that even if it's ice water around them, they can live through that. It's kind of a fun thing for kids, you know, put them in the freezer. 
freeze them, take them out, let them come back to life. I used to do that with my kids. They probably didn't think it was as much fun as I thought it was. Um, so anyway, I, I talked to people about this. There are other species in cedar swamps that bite people. This mosquito may be just a bird biting mosquito, but she's amplifying the disease in this habitat. And then there are species of mosquitoes that bite both birds and people and carry it into the human population. I like to mention that people, even if you're not going to Wellfleet, for instance, to walk through the Atlantic White Cedar Swamp at Cape Cod National Seashore, people are walking by these habitats all the time. Um, you know it because they are trails on properties like that, but also all the golf courses have these swamps in the middle of them. People are yeah. walking through them all the time and by them. So anyway, that's, a, that's the type of habitat, especially since we had so many positive samples in 2019 that we focus on because we don't want that species to get to a point where there's a lot of transmission going on. Yeah, wait, I just want to say um, yeah. that was that was one of my like preloaded questions for you yeah. was why there's so much clearing around our cedar swamps in Falmouth. Yeah. And because um, oh, we view I them think. as such like special habitats that we want protected. Yeah. Um, so uh, definitely that's, and especially after 2019, Falmouth was our one town that had multiple positive samples come back in multiple species for Eastern equine encephalitis. And we had to step up our efforts and we even did a targeted for the first time and only time I hope to heck in our history did a targeted small section of Falmouth right. where we sprayed with a truck. Right. It just got to a point where I, um, better than getting to the point where somebody gets sick or dies or the state, God forbid, sends planes overhead spreading their right. uh, adult aside all over us. So, so um, just another question. So sure. when you are managing um, Atlantic White Cedar Swamps for this specific mosquito, mm -hmm. um, does the granules work? Like the, oh, is definitely. that what you do? Definitely. That's what we do. That. In general, like I said, 19, 2019 was a, an, a, definitely an exception. Yeah. Usually we're able to access the swamps, get around them and get to all those crypts. You can imagine um, this spring, it's a lot easier. Usually those swamps, this spring to walk in those swamps does not really reflect what those swamps usually look like. Because the water's low. The water is so low. Yes. Usually walking around those swamps, you'd have hip boots on. Yes. And you wouldn't even see the crypts because they'd all be deep underwater. You, you can see the water line on the trees for where it usually is. This yes. year is exceptionally dry. So this year it's much easier. You can walk around, you can put a handful of granules right into the crypt and not have any worry about it. Okay. So Thank yeah, for that. definitely. And I'll say that um, it's interesting to look at the cedar swamps this time of year, as opposed to give it another month, because you walk around now, none of the ferns are up, they're just starting to pop. So the, they're very open right now, but in some of those cedar swamps, the ferns are, Chatham has just the most fantastic ferns I've ever seen in swamps. It's, it's ridiculous. It's like, I feel like I've gone in, back in time to the time of dinosaurs and some of those uh, Chatham swamps after the ferns get super high. Um, it's actually really cool. I, I think cedar swamps are just some of the most special places ever. They're, they're yeah. amazing. They're quiet. They're, yeah, I love the cedar swamps. Anyway, and we're willing to work with anybody on the type of work we do. So for instance, um, I noticed Provincetown isn't here, right? Provincetown isn't here. No. So we worked with Provincetown on one of their properties. We did, we wanted to put in paths. We'd never had paths in that property before. So we talked to them about it because most of these sites we've been going to since 1930, but that was a site that we hadn't been in and we hadn't been in lately. So we talked to them, we put in the paths, we took pictures before when we originally put in the paths and then they looked at the pictures later in the summer and you can see how different those paths really are once all the vegetation grows in. But we're willing to work with anybody on any anything that they'd like. So you, know, um, or, you might or, be getting to this, but do you have maps showing where you do intensive management on properties? So we have a map, I sent that map to at least Julie. Um, we have a map that shows all of our sites. So if you go to that map, you can, I can send that link to anybody. Okay. You go to the map, there are little dots all over Cape Cod because there are at least 4,000 of them. 
and you can click on the dot and you can give me the site number and I can tell you all the history that happened there. Perfect. Okay. Great. Yes. Anytime. Um, so we're doing monitoring for mosquitoes that might possibly be carrying um, Eastern equine encephalitis. That species of mosquito, Culicida melanora, is a bird biter and not as attractive to my light traps. Probably, maybe it's because of the level of um, CO2, I don't know, but they're not as attractive. So we use these black boxes in, around a few of the cedar swamps. We're looking for swamps that have a lot of roosting birds because these are bird biting mosquitoes and the type of habitat again, where these mosquitoes might develop. So we put these brown bo black boxes around these swamps. And so the mosquitoes, this Culicida melanora, she goes up and feeds on those roosting birds at night. And then she comes back down and looks for a place to get out of the sun, out of the wind so she can develop her eggs. She goes into these boxes. It's the most ridiculously simple thing ever. Um, and it's really just those mosquitoes. It's the females that have already bitten a bird so it's the most likely point in time in their life cycle when they would have disease if disease was in the area. So we have these around the swamps um, at three swamps historically, and then we can put them out more if we see disease issues coming up. So we collect from, we have one in Wellfleet, one in Dennis and one in Barnesville. We collect from those on a weekly basis throughout the summer. We're sending in samples to the state lab for testing on a weekly basis throughout the summer. We send in our samples, or last year we were driving them in because I couldn't trust UPS with mosquitoes in the mail that had to stay cold and had to get there within 24 hours because there's a cold chain. We take them back to the lab, we identify the species, we keep them cold, ship them on ice overnight to the state labs. Um, we might just keep driving them. Uh, anyway, so we send those in and on Thursday morning, we wait to see if we get a phone call. You hope you don't get a phone call. Um, so that's Eastern equine encephalitis. This is the species of mosquito Culex pipiens. That's the, the mosquito species that is in our area, the most likely vector of West Nile virus. There are a few different species that may be vectoring West Nile virus to people. This is the most common one. The, her common name is the common house mosquito. Mosquitoes are like wild animals. They all have different behaviors. This species has a behavior where if you open up your door, she'll come on in. So that's why she's the common house mosquito. She's the most likely mosquito that's buzzing around in your house at night. They're finding you because of every time you breathe out, you're breathing out that carbon dioxide. So even if it's dark in the house, she's still finding you, um, which is good because you're still breathing. Um, so anyway, this mosquito species is a little different and West Nile virus is, thank goodness, a little different. West Nile virus, um, about 80% of the people who get West Nile virus show no symptoms at all. 20% of the people who, who um, get West Nile virus show symptoms like a summer flu, a summer cold. Um, and then there's a small percentage of people who develop uh, encephalitis or meningitis from West Nile virus. Um, there must be variants of it because Dallas had um, an outbreak in, I want to say 2012, where they had a number of deaths from West Nile virus. Uh, it's just, it just depends. Um, this mosquito is different from, in a lot of ways, from that other mosquito that I was showing you for Eastern equine encephalitis. It's much more likely humans will become exposed to West Nile virus. This mosquito bites both birds and people. It takes out that middle mosquito that you need with Eastern encephalitis. This mosquito bites the bird, picks up the disease, carries it to the human population. Um, this mosquito lays her eggs and develops in man-made containers like bird baths and gutters. And she will sometimes, you can sometimes find this mosquito. There's another species very similar that also transmits the disease in natural habitats, um, but not as likely. This mosquito doesn't fly very far. If you have this mosquito, she's out at dark, late dusk, dark when she's out there flying. The mosquitoes that transmit disease pretty much are active, the most likely, transmitters of disease will be active from dusk to dark. Maybe that two hours after dusk is when you see those most active. And the freshwater mosquitoes don't fly very far. If you have these mosquitoes around you, they're coming from your yard. Everybody says it's their neighbor's yard. From the road drains. And that is something that we can take care of. This is where education comes in. We do a lot of going around the houses and out of the 300 people that call, uh, 
I'm not going to say majority, maybe half of them are calling about something that they're creating in their own yard. So it's just about educating people about where the mosquitoes are coming from. There, there are on properties and town properties, we sometimes come across tire dumps and things like that. Unfortunately, people are terrible and they dump things on property not their own. But you're all aware of that. I don't need to tell you. Yeah, I think um, this group is pretty versed in that. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, it's depressing to see what people dump out in the woods. I think, I think it'd be good if it was easier to not have to pay to go to the dump with your whatever, but that's a town issue, not a land issue. Um, anyway, catch basins are the perfect habitat for that species of mosquitoes. The road drains are all up and down the roads. Road drains, maybe 20, 30 years ago now, were built so that instead of the water draining off the road into the groundwater with all the stuff, chemicals, whatever on the road, directly into the groundwater, that drains off the road into the catch basin. And the catch basin is meant to hold a couple feet of water. Yes. And then they got the leaves in there and you got, it's dark and the wind isn't blowing down there. They're all mosquito farms up and down the roads, all over Cape Cod. So we treat those with another bacteria, Bacillus sphericus. So we use the BTI pretty much in the natural habitats. The Bacillus sphericus tends to last a little longer um, and it's better for these more organic habitats like the catch basins. I think last year we treated maybe 18,000 catch basins on Cape Cod, something about, somewhere around there. Yeah. We're monitoring for those mosquitoes as well. Um, this is a gravid trap. So what we do is set up a trap that mimics that habitat. That's a man-made container that's got organic water in it. We make stinky organic water at the lab. We pour it in a Rubbermaid container. There are a few different versions of this trap, but they all work the same way. The female mosquito comes in to lay her eggs in that stinky water. That's the technical term. And there's a fan above it and she gets sucked up into the net. And again, this is the time in their physiological life cycle where they most likely have disease. She's already bitten a bird, she's developed eggs, and now she's going to lay her eggs. So we have these traps out all over Cape Cod, mostly from the mid Cape to the upper Cape because of habitat and because of catch basins. A lot of the catch basins on the lower Cape are still the older catch basins. Um, so we're collecting from those traps on a weekly basis. We also have a number of traps. I don't have them on this map in Joint Base Cape Cod. So I know it looks like a big area, but we have a volunteer group that does our collections in Joint Base Cape Cod. Again, collect those mosquitoes, bring them back to the lab, identify them, ship them on ice overnight to the state labs for testing for West Nile virus. Just to give you an idea of what we've seen for disease here, kind of think this is interesting. This is a graph from 1993 because I started here in 1993. So I know that the trapping was done the same way over these years and the testing. West Nile virus didn't come into Massachusetts until the early 2000s. That's an imported disease that didn't come into the United States until the year 99, 2000. Um, but you can see over time, perhaps a trend with these diseases West Nile virus is that red line. And you can see in 2018, we had historic levels of West Nile virus, and then in 19, it went way down. And a lot of this is weather related as well. And 2019, we had historic levels of East Mid equine encephalitis coming back here. This is just Barnesville County. And 2000, thank goodness for the drought, because I don't know if I could have taken COVID and arbovirus in one summer. So yeah, thank goodness. Um, but anyway, we have seen trends in species over time. I, I have seen trends that I can um, graph over time with species that we didn't used to see here. And when I first started trapping, there's a southern salt marsh mosquito that I never saw here. And now in some areas of the Cape, that's the salt marsh mosquito that I see most commonly. So I won't say climate change, but I will say climate change, something's changed. And I've seen it in the species of mosquitoes I'm collecting in my regular sampling. You can go online to the State Department of Public Health. They have an interactive website that gives you information on arbovirus in your area. This is last year, again, whew, thank goodness, um, it was a drought. 
They have maps that show risk for transmission for West Nile virus or Eastern encephalitis in your area. These are gonna be based on sampling for Barnesville County. It'll be based on the samples we're sending in on a weekly basis. And I'm hoping never based on human or horse cases of either of these diseases. Something that's new to our area, like I said before, you're seeing changes in the species of mosquitoes that you see here. Um, I am, I find it fascinating. <laughs> um, our invasive species is the Asian tiger mosquito. We're doing surveillance, um, not necessarily with traps that look like this, but similar traps where we have black cups. Um, I hope they're hidden so that nobody runs into them. They're black cups where we put water in them and we put paper in them. This type of mosquito lays her eggs in small containers that have water in them. She likes water bottles and stuff like that to lay her eggs in. It's a very urban mosquito. Um, so we have these out so that we're collecting egg papers and then hatching them to see if this mosquito is in our area. We found them only in a few samples, sandwich in 17. We found them in Harwichport in 18 and 20. Found them at the 19. You tend to see them where we found them, even though we've got a bunch of these cups out, around the um, marinas where the boats are coming in. I think it's, um, I'm gonna blame Bristol County. It's Bristol County has a much bigger population of this mosquito species. And I think the boats are filling up at some of these places, or I can't just say that. Uh, the Harwichport one, definitely there were a lot of New York plates on the trailers. And I would say New York has a lot of this mosquito species as well, New Jersey. They bite during the day. They're nasty little um, daytime biters. They tend to bite legs. So we do ask people about that sort of thing now when they call in. If you have tiny mosquitoes biting you, they're tending to bite your legs. They're biting during the day. There's a chance that they're these Asian tiger mosquitoes. Um, it's bad enough that they're aggressive biters during the day, but these mosquitoes would be the first time we have a vector species here in the area that can transmit things like yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, Zika. These mosquitoes are the type of mosquito that can pick up Zika, for instance, from one person and carry it to another person. What is, do you, do you guys know like the flight range for them? Um, they don't fly very far. That's why we do have these cups at the uh, close to where the boats are getting gas. And I would say that that's really where it's happening because although the Harwich Port one last year, I don't know if that was necessarily at the marina. It wasn't, it was uh, another site. So. Yeah, they don't fly very far at all. Okay. It's just that they're prolific. They lay their eggs in literally anything they can find with standing water. So you can imagine in a her an urban habitat, how many bottles are laying around with water from the rain that just never yeah. goes away. We worked with the county in 19. They developed a flyer that we gave out to people reminding them to be safe, that you really have to consider that mosquito bites aren't just a nuisance. I never understand it. We get people who call us who will tell Katie, who's our administrative person, um, they'll call, they'll say, my kids were out last night and they have a hundred mosquito bites. You didn't think when they got the first few that they should come in or put on long pants or spray repellent, pick one of those things. As far as repellents, you can see on this, um, poster that I have up there, number of different repellents that have been that have been tested. They have EPA registration numbers on them. When I'm choosing a repellent, I look at the label, I choose a repellent with an EPA registration number on it. That means that that repellent has been tested to be effective and safe to use on skin. I'm sure some of you have probably had Larry Dapsis from the county come in and talk to you about ticks. He would say the same thing. You see at the farmer's market, people selling natural repellents. They are not, they are not required to get an EPA registration because of the, pro, the active ingredients in them. That means they're not being tested for either efficacy or safety. And the county extension gets calls every summer about people who get rashes and different skin reactions to these things. And they're not tested for efficacy. If you feel more comfortable and You'd rather use oil of lemon eucalyptus. There are products that the EPA has tested with an active ingredient of oil of lemon eucalyptus. So I, I just try to encourage people. Senior core does a lot for me. So I always put in this slide, they're great. They have a great volunteer network. Oh my goodness. Yeah, Kelly. 
Sorry, um, is there a place where we can find that flyer just to make available to our volunteers and other folks? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can send you a copy of it. I have a copy. Okay, thank you. Yep. My senior core, they're the ones who do all my surveillance on Joint Base Cape Cod. They have a great network of volunteers. Anybody can call me anytime. Um, we have an entomologist here, Aubrey Paolino, who will be happy to give talks to the public, maybe less focused on, maybe more public friendly than this talk was. I don't know. I think this was public friendly. But anyway, Aubrey does really nice talks for the public if anybody's interested. Anybody can call me anytime. We work with different land management managers across the Cape, whether it's uh, Cape Cod National Seashore or whether it's the Conservation Trust in Provincetown or Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge. We, we're happy to work with anybody. Any concerns you have, anything that you'd happy to meet you on site, whatever, feel free to contact me. I love to talk about what we do and always looking to keep an open mind to do things. I, we really want to make it work for everybody. So got to end with the mosquito picture, right? 